Hi everyone, welcome to Research Insiders 6. My name is Divan and I'll be your host for today. We'll also be broadcasting our session live on MBIOS Facebook, so please feel free to share the live stream with your friends and family. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session towards the end of the presentation. So should you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to type them out in the chat box or unmute to ask later. So our ability to host events for our student members was made possible by the general support of our sponsor, UK Education Centre. UK Education Centre is the leading education agency in the UK that provides free support and services for students who are looking into higher education in the UK, such as university applications, visa services and more. So if you are stu our student member and considering to apply to UK universities, we will recommend you to get in touch with UKEC for a free one-to-one -one consultation today. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our MBIOS certificate scheme, which allows our current MBIOS members to receive certificate for their participation in any of our events. There are currently three certificate tires to be claimed, and this works as an accumulation, which you have to participate in respective numbers of events as per the tire outline to claim the certificate. We will also need a proof of your attendance in the form of a screenshot to be able to claim the certificate. So if you're interested to be part of the scheme, kindly check out MBIO social media for more information. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our speaker for today's session, Jay Shui Lo. Jay Shui graduated from Taylor's University with a bachelor's degree in biomedical science, specializing in microbiology back in uh, 2018. During her time in Taylor's, she was also a recipient of Taylor's world-class scholarship. She then completed her master's in human-centered science and biomedical engineering at Tokyo Institute of Technology back in 2021. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in human-centered science and biomedical engineering at Tokyo Institute of Technology as well. She's also the recipient of Japanese government MEXT scholarship. Now, I would like to invite Jeshi to take the floor to provide us with further insights into her academic background and also her research studies. Let's welcome Jeshri. Thank you all again so much for the opportunity and thank you all for joining. Um, to first clarify, I'm not here to re I'm not here representing my university in any way or any of my alma mater. My research is mainly on circadian rhythm. Uh, unfortunately, today I cannot reveal too much about my my own research. Um, however, to be honest, I I think circadian rhythm is a little bit hard to explain. Personally, as a master's student, I also was the first time introduced to circadian rhythm. So it was a bit of a struggle, but later I really learned to enjoy this uh, topic. It's very interesting. So we'll move on. So first of all, how many of you are considering a PhD? Okay, that's nice, one of you. That's good. Um, so to those of you who are considering, any of you are considering because of these reasons, <laughs> these are reasons that I've heard previously. So anyone considering because they want a doctor title or they want to go abroad, or is it a dream career requirement? Or do you have interest towards research or even others? Well, I guess I know that I just learned that it's also a Facebook Live. So if you're any of these, anything, any of your reasons is fine. I'd like, just like to share that for me, it was actually a dream career requirement. I wanted to be uh, a scientist working to help uh, solve infections, uh, problems related to infections. And it's also five others is because I really love to read and write and which is something that a lot of researchers have to do moving on. So yes, I did get the Japanese government scholarship. So now the question is why Japan, right? Because most of us go into Australia, England, um, I think England, New Zealand, as well as uh, Singapore and US. For me, I actually got introduced to the idea of going to Japan um, from, my, uh, from my lecturers, mainly Dr. Louis Chung Yang, who also received the Japanese MEX scholarship to do his PhD in Tohoku University. Uh, Dr. To, who also received the Max scholarship, she did her PhD in Tokyo University. 
and another mentor from another university, which is uh, Professor Sudesh Kumar, who also received the Max scholarship to do his to do his PhD in Saitama University. And at the time when I was uh, looking for a scholarship, this was the only scholarship that I saw that had both masters and PhD in in the scholarship program. Okay, so to apply for the Japanese government Max scholarship, there are actually two routes. One is the embassy and one is the university. And I've actually tried both. I failed the embassy, but I passed the university application. So do you need Japanese language? Uh, that really depends. It depends on first the lab that you're applying to. And it also depends on the fact that, um, for example, in the embassy, you will have to sit for a language test. You may pass or you may fail. I think when I was applying, they said it's okay, it doesn't matter. But a senior of mine who actually passed the embassy said that for them, it does matter. So because they knew Japanese, so they actually got shortlisted. It's based on your application as well as your language, I think. But when I was applying, uh, they told me that it doesn't matter that I speak or not. Uh, but definitely the lab that you apply for, that's important. Like if it's a fully Japanese lab, then it's better to have that language uh, ability. So the scholarship does uh, include the full tuition fee. It includes allowance and it includes a flight ticket to and from. That means when you go to Japan, one ticket, and when you come back from Japan, another ticket. So this is the process. Okay. So first thing you should do is apply is contact your potential supervisors in Japan. Say if you want to apply to a specific lab in Tokyo University or Tokyo Tech or anywhere, you should contact those potential supervisors and tell them that you want to apply for the Japanese government Max scholarship. Um, it's also important that when you apply, you should read about the lab. You should read about one or two of their recent publications and don't be too um, narrow on your on your research interests. Say if you would like to do, um, if you're interested in cancer, be open to various aspects of cancer, not just specifically, oh, I want to work on this molecular mechanism of cancer. Now that would be a bit difficult for supervisors to um, accommodate you if you want to be very specific. And then second would be you go through the interview. This happens in both university as well as for the embassy, you do go through a language test. Um, this is like you just it's like a big hall where you have all the students to be sitting down and sitting for a paper test. In the embassy, they'll ask you to sit for I think Japanese and yeah, Japanese. Japanese, and you also have to submit um your English capability, for example, IELTS or Buet or something. And then after that, you'll go through a final interview. This can vary uh, depending on whether you apply for university or embassy. So when you, the number of interviews vary depending on whether you apply for embassy or university. For embassy, you have two, which is the second one and the fifth. But for university, it can vary. For me, it was two, um, but some universities require three. And then once you've done that, then yay, you become a Mac scholar, and then you embark into your masters and your PhD, which is uh, two different mountains to climb. So how to pick your lab or your PhD program? Um, I would definitely encourage you to apply through by finding a Malaysian mentor. Like for me, I had three lecturers who could guide me through the process, who could assess whether um, I was fit, like whether I was, you know, whether I had the skills to do a master's and a PhD or whether there were other things that I need to improve on before I apply. Um, they definitely will be the best people to guide you through the labs because they will know what to look for, what to consider, and they'll also be able to introduce you to supervisors or collaborators. Um, as well as guiding you through the postgraduate degree. And what I mean by guiding through the postgraduate degree, sometimes um, you may have problems, like you don't know how to 
you don't know how to express yourself or you think or sometimes you might feel like it's a lot of like you don't know how to solve this problem. Um, solving research problems is best to talk to your own supervisor, but I mean problems such as um, like for me, the problem was that I felt that it was suddenly very overwhelming and how do I solve that issue? So one of my super, one of my, not supervisor, one of my former lecturers told me to take a break, you know, sleep and then wait three days, think of your problem and then go back to lab. So those things you can discuss with your mentor back home. Um, second is again, look at the laboratory website. That's very important. You need to look at the research areas and if you don't know how to speak Japanese, the best thing to do is to look at the number of international students they have. This will give you a rough um, guide as to how, how open the lab is to international students. That's one. Two is whether you can use English or not. Because if there's less than in international students, there's a higher chance that Japanese is used as the medium in the lab. And um, one good thing would be to see how many students actually graduate every five years, um, because sometimes projects can be very long. And if you're applying for under a scholarship, you have a limited time. Um, specifically, you have five years. So it would be good to see if there are students graduating every five years. There are also some lecturers who are retiring, so they may not take in as many students as you hope for. So sometimes, before you actually email them, it would be good to see if there's too many students or if, if there are many students or not. If there are not many, maybe, just maybe the lecturer might be thinking of retiring. So that is something to think about as well. I also say third is to be open to different research topics. Um, for example, I was interested in infection and I thought that I would be studying the microbes, but I actually got an opportunity to study the immunology part of the infection, not to say the bacteria or the fungus virus, but actually cells react to it, which is also very interesting. So let me just share a little bit about circadian rhythm. I'm actually working on circadian rhythm and infections, which is a field that you can get some papers, especially when it comes to virus, but Again, because I think not many people would have known. So I will just touch a little bit on circadian rhythm and we can definitely discuss about it later. So circadian rhythm is basically the molecular clock in your cells. So do you guys know how a clock works? Have you guys seen, we, we know like, I know a lot of people now have automated like the digital clock, but can you, let me just share this. Hmm. Okay. Right, so can you see this clock? No, it's upside down. So every clock has a second, minute, and hours hand, right? So for the minute clock to turn one minute, the second clock has to turn 60 seconds, correct? It has to tick 60 times. And then the minute clock, once it turns 100 and, uh, 360, which is 60 minutes, then the hour clock moves by one. So in other words, if the second time, if the second hand, doesn't tick 60 seconds, the minute hand won't work, right? So circadian rhythm is like the 60 seconds tick. It has to tick 60 seconds for all the other parts of the cells to work. So on a molecular mechanism, so this BMA1 and clock. Okay, so these one, two, three, four, five, six are all, are a group of proteins clock related proteins. So these clock related proteins work like the seconds hand, the seconds uh, ticking in the clock. So if the clock ticks 60 times, it'll turn one minute and for it to turn every minute, it has to tick 60, 60 times, right? So similarly, the clock related proteins also generate this into the cell. So what happens actually? So BMAL1 and clock will team up, they will bind together and activate the transcriptions or the production of D 
these are the clock related proteins per cry broad and ref erb now per and cry will then team up it will bind together to stop the bima one and clock dimer and this and this action actually stops its own production as well as these other two circadian rhythm proteins now similarly these two clock related proteins actually compete for the this promoter site so this promoter is actually the to produce this protein so ROR actually activates the production of this protein and REV ERB actually inhibits the production of this protein. So in circadian rhythm, if there is some, um, for example, if you're not getting enough sunlight or if you're not um, taking food at the regular time or if you're not having enough sleep, all this can disrupt this molecular mechanism in your cell. And when this happens, your other gene expressions, for example, your immune response or your metabolic responses will may be affected and may be dysregulated. So why is this such a problem in today? It's because, for example, we're now exposed to light almost 24 seven, which disrupts our clock. Usually the biggest, um, how do I call this? It's called a Zeitgerber, but it's like a factor or an environmental factor that affects our circadian rhythm the most is actually light. And so before the invention of light bulbs, we only have sunlight for like, for example, like in Malaysia, it'd be 7 a.m. to what, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., right? And so after that, we don't have any light, which means our body learns that, okay, it's time to sleep. It's time to reduce the metabolic um, responses and all that. And it's, it's time to go to bed, right? Now, when we are exposed to light all the time, our body actually cannot tell when it's time to go to sleep or when it's time to stay awake. Well, technically we can, but it affects us in some ways. And that's why nowadays you feel that um, sometimes when you're very stressed, you can just work the whole night, right? So why is it that you don't feel that tiredness or whatever? It's partly because there's a lot of light. If you don't have that light, you just can't do any work and you'll go to sleep. That's the truth. So what are the real life applications of circadian rhythm? One of it is actually BCG vaccinations. So a publication in the Journal of Clinical Investigations actually found that if you have your BCG vaccinations in the morning, it actually gives you better immunity because it activates your um, adaptive immune response which means that your body will produce more antib antibodies and that can actually fight these, um, which will make the vaccination a lot more better. Now, second, one that is very famous that came out in the news is that um, Amber Leong, she actually created the circadian optic therapy lamp, which brings artificial sunlight into homes and offices, which keeps you wondering why would why would somebody want to bring artificial sunlight when, when exposing to sunlight and exposing to light is already a big problem? So the reason is because that Amber Leong actually was working in Minnesota. And when she was working in an office, she rarely gets proper sunlight exposure. So what she did was she thought of this. She actually bought a lamp, but it was, it made her look a bit awkward in the office. So she created this optics in order to have like um, stylish, stylish and um, what do I call it? Stylish, stylish light therapy at your table without like, without having to be mocked at. And when she designed this, she actually pitched this idea on Shark Tank and she won 800,000 USD which is an equivalent to, I think, what, 3 million, 3 million, 3 million ringgit. Yeah, so these are things that um, we are seeing with circadian rhythm. The other things that circadian rhythm is actually 
trying to solve, for example, um, well, not circuitry, sorry, circuitry, the researchers are trying to solve. For example, um, do you guys know SAD? It's, uh, it happens during winter where people get a bit depressed because there's a lot less sunlight. And people found out that when you expose people to more sunlight, it actually helps reduce the depression syndrome. Uh, but I don't know much about that research because uh, it's a bit hard for me to understand those as well. So my research actually focuses more on the molecular mechanism. I want to see what are the ways we can use this mechanism to improve our immune system to fighting the infections. It is a bit hard to rely on antifungals or antibacterials or antivirals because in fact, infection, because pathogens are actually getting um, more resistant to these antibiotics. Um, as you guys may also know, WHO is actually putting this as a huge concern because when you have uh, antibacterial, antiviral, or antifungal um, resistant pathogens, it can actually cause widespread um, infections, not only in public, but actually the more problematic place would be actually in hospitals, which we all know as nosocomial infections. Here is a fun thing that we can all do is that we can actually find out what is our chronotype. So I'll just share the link to the quiz. It's a very interesting quiz because it actually tells you when you can, when is the best time for you to work. So actually not all of us are equipped to work at night or in the day. And so learning when your chronotype is would be a good indicator of what kind of job would be good for you. So I can actually wake up really early and I'm actually productive until 11 or 12. Once I have my lunch, I'm really, I'm not productive, especially two to three is my worst time. So what I usually started doing is I actually started taking a nap and it does work. So sometimes I can't really take a nap because I've got quite a bit of things to do. So I, what I do is after I took this quiz, I actually start, sorry, I actually start putting my more heavier work in the morning and then I do my lighter work in the evening or after my lunchtime. So yeah, it's an interesting thing to learn. And uh, interestingly, most of the, so the geniuses in the world are actually in the dolphin category. They all um, have disrupted scene, but um, they can work anytime as long as they're awake. Yes, so this is the end of my presentation.